Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third edition of UCD Alumni Relations webinar series, UCD in Conversation. I'm Grace Allen. I'm the Alumni Relations Officer for UCD College of Social Sciences. Each Thursday at these webinars, we really enjoy welcoming UCD alum and the community from around the world to share their stories and ideas and the impact that they're having on society. This series also reflects UCD's new strategy, Rising to the Future, and its four strategic themes. Creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering technology, empowering humanity, beg your pardon. Uh, as you may know, UCD are at the forefront of uh, the efforts in fighting COVID-19. Um, and they're also committed to supporting students through this really difficult time. You may have seen our COVID-19 appeal on social media or on our website. So we're aiming to raise a million euro to support these efforts. We'd like to extend our thanks to those of you who have kindly supported the appeal already. And if you'd like to find out more, we'll have the link in the chat box soon. So the format for the evening will be a 30 to 40 minute conversation, followed by about 10 or 15 minutes of questions. We're hoping to finish up at 7.45 or 8 o'clock. You can submit questions throughout the talk um, using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And Shane will get to as many of these as he can throughout the evening, but please don't be disappointed if your question doesn't get answered. If you need to leave the conversation early or if your connection drops, don't worry. The conversation is being recorded and it will be available on the UCD Alumni YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Shane Bergen, an assistant professor in science education at UCD and his colleagues from UCD School of Education, Dr. Emma Farrell and Dr. Anya Mahan, so they can discuss the philosophy of mental well-being. Over to you, Shane. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, good evening, everybody. You're, you're very welcome to a virtual UCD, which uh, is myself uh, and Emma and Anya's working experience at the moment as we uh, do our teaching and research from home. You're very welcome to this evening's conversation, um, which is in the philosophy of mental well-being. Um, and as, as Grace has said, we'll have a conversation, uh, myself, Anya and Emma, for a little while and then we will invite you to submit questions and answers or you can do that during uh, the conversation and we'll get to as many of those as possible uh, toward the end. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and all keeping safe in your homes at, the, at, at this time. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce to you our, our two uh, panellists this evening. Firstly, uh, Dr. Emma Farrell is a, 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 well, she's a philosopher first and foremost and she's an expert in mental health. Uh, she is a postdoctoral fellow in UCD's uh, School of Education. Emma has a, a, a great background that spans academia and the world beyond. Um, some years ago, she was a co-founder of Jigsaw, the National Centre for Mental Health. Emma did her PhD in Trinity College, uh, finishing in 2017, looking at the lived experiences of students with mental health difficulties. Uh, she's an expert advisor to the College of Psychiatry and she is on the, uh, on the board for the President's Awards, or Goshka. Um, so along with Emma, we have uh, Dr. Anya uh, Mahan. Anya is an assistant professor, also in the School of Education. And uh, Anya's interests are philosophy of education and philosophy of literature. So uh, Anya did her PhD in Nottingham, where she worked on uh, two thinkers, Rorty and Cavell. She might mention them this evening if we're lucky. Um, and as well as her, her academic pursuits, uh, Anya is also interested in, in young people's perceptions of philosophy. A few years ago, she co-founded the Irish Young Philosophers Awards, which she might also mention this evening. So I'm going to uh, briefly ask Emma to tell me a little bit more about the things she's interested in during her work in UCD. Thanks, Shane. That was a really great introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so as you say, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Education in UCD, which is actually a great place to be a researcher, not just in terms of UCD has been a great place to be an early career researcher, but also to be in the School of Education, because as you said, my background is quite multidisciplinary. I have a background in mental health, but I'm particularly interested in philosophy and what that has to say about and for mental health. 
but also in the role of education in all of that and how we think about not just things like mental health and philosophy, but how we go about thinking about the world and our being in the world. So at the moment, I'm, I predominantly am a researcher and I'm particularly interested in children and young people's mental health and well-being. Thanks, Emma. Anya, how about you? What kind of work are you doing in the School of Education? Uh, thanks, Shane. So I'm, as you said, I'm assistant professor in the School of Education. I am interested in philosophy of education and philosophy of literature. And I also, I, I teach. I, I teach on the professional masters of education. So that's the program for becoming secondary school teachers. And I supervise on the masters and the PhD. Um, I actually came to UCD in 2011, almost 10 years ago now, which is a little bit frightening. I had um, a two-year IRC postdoc in the School of Philosophy. And for me, that was a really great time personally and professionally. I was really lucky to be mentored by some of the wonderful faculty in UCD School of Philosophy by people like Neil Cook, Roland Stout, Jim O'Shea, but especially by Maria Bagramian, who's always been a very generous figure for younger academics coming up. And Maria was a big influence in my career. And this is partly because philosophy tends to be a very male dominated space. So it was important for me as an early career woman to be able to look to Maria as a role model. And she was always there to kind of fight her corner and to encourage us to be very ambitious and imaginative in the kind of projects that we pursued. Um, so I, you know, I, I think a lot of credit goes to Maria and um, I, owe, I owe a lot to the School of Philosophy. Um, I have some links weirdly also with the School of Irish. Um, uh, well, I don't know if they would claim that I have links with them. I want to claim links with them. Um, in 2017, I, I decided for some crazy reason to do a two-year diploma in Wielga Um And that was an absolutely fantastic experience. I was so lucky to be taught by the wonderful Imer Nguyen, who's currently on leave. I hope she'll be back soon. Um, uh, so that was, that was a, a fantastic experience for so many reasons. Um, it was a bit terrifying also because I found myself back in the RDS doing exams with UCD undergraduate students. So um, that was very, very strange. But I like to think that it's made me a better teacher now because it makes me a bit more empathetic um, to students, particularly those who are working full time and studying full time because that, that's not easy and I appreciate that now. Absolutely. I'd uh, echo your sentiments about the, uh, the horrors of, of the RDS when sitting an exam. And I'm sure many who are, who are watching this evening can, can think back to their own experiences as UCD students. Um, I'd also echo your comments about Maria, our colleague in philosophy, being, being a wonderful mentor to so many people. I think we are lucky to work in a school of education where a physicist, a philosopher and an expert in mental health can, can have lunch together and share so many conversations. But I'd like to talk and get right into the, the heart of the issue, um, which is, is about philosophy and, and mental well-being or mental health. And so recently, uh, you guys wrote a, an article that was published in Silicon Republic, um, and it looked at how philosophy can guide or can influence or can just make us think about the, the current COVID situation that we're living through. And Emma, you might tell us a little bit about what the article uh, tried to say and what inspired you both to, uh, to write it. Of course. Um, yeah, it was one of those things that maybe comes easily when you have a good collaborative relationship with a colleague like Anya. I was one Saturday morning, I was in bed reading the Fintan O'Toole article where it was, I think it was the second week, maybe the first week of the pandemic shutdown. And he was talking about how this pandemic has forced us not just to do things differently, but to think about things differently. And it really struck a chord because at that time, and, and still now, there's a lot of conversation and advice particularly on social media about looking after our mental health and it's all very good it's a typically you know five a day for mental health things we can do to look after our mental health so you know that we know all the things like go out for a walk and stay connected with people even if it's only through zoom or skype and you know try and set a routine for ourselves and all of these things which are all actually quite good you know they make sense but for me, especially at that particular time, they didn't really get to the depths of what we were contending with. A lot of the pandemic, what it did for us is really take away that kind of haze of the habitual, that those routines and habits and things we take for granted, the getting up and the going and the coming and the, all the different things that fill our time and our lives. And it kind of cleared a little bit and we were left looking at how we use our time, what's important to us, our relationships, our jobs. And we're really forced to think about things which most of us can get through our lives without ever really having to pause and reflect on. 
And I think that while the tips and tricks around managing our mental health are all very important, they didn't really do it. And for me, I think philosophy has something that has, has been really helpful in thinking about how do we manage ourselves as human beings. And the joy of philosophy is that it's thousands of years old. If we think about the main disciplines in, in mental health, it might only be, I mean, psychiatry is probably only about 200 years old. So we have these thousands of years of thinkers and thought about how do we live? How do we live in the face of adversity and struggle? How do we live a good life? And these are the kinds of things that Anya and I had been speaking about. So immediately that Saturday morning, wrote down a few things and emailed Anya and she, she took over from there. Well, Anya, what did you do with Emma's inspiration? Well, um, I, I, I think for, for me, a lot of this came back to the idea of, of, of heavy discourses. Um, so as I mentioned before, I, I teach philosophy of education. And one idea I'm always coming back to with the student teachers is this idea of prevailing discourses that get in the way, I suppose. So they're, they're not very helpful. So even in the context of education and context of secondary school teaching, we have particular ways of talking about teaching. We have a certain lingo that you need to become fluent in. So we talk about things like, I don't know, classroom management and reflective practice um, and learning outcomes. And this is all very necessary because you're being socialized into that profession. You have to learn to talk and walk like a teacher. But I always, I always think that there's a point when those types of discourses, that lingo gets in your way, it stops you thinking in ways that are meaningful for you. And I think there's a related point here to be made about mental health. And part of what Emma and I are interested in is philosophy's ability to broaden that discourse, to give us perhaps a different set of terms or concepts to bring to the conversation. It's about making sense of these experiences in a different way. And as Emma says, you know, Philosophers have been thinking about these issues for millennia. It was only in kind of the 1870s and onward that psychology and later psychoanalysis and then all the other various branches of psychology started to, to break away. But these are perennial philosophical questions. Um, philosophers have continually dealt with them and they're continually dealing with them now. Um, so I think it would be, it would, it would just be a mistake not to look to this kind of treasure trove of ideas and not to look to philosophy as kind of a, a, a complementary perspective here. Absolutely. So I, I've heard you both talk about this, this idea of, you know, that the discourse and prevailing discourses and, and how it, how it can very much dominate a, a conversation on something like, like education. And as Emma mentioned, and mental health, how does that manifest itself? Emma? And, and how, how does philosophy, as it were, break through or try to disrupt that uh, discourse? Or maybe that's not a helpful way of phrasing it, but you know what I mean in terms of like changing the way we think and talk about something like mental health. Yeah, I think disrupt maybe isn't the word that I would use, but I think for me, what I've been really interested and in, particularly in my research in trying to understand how people make sense of their experiences of mental health problems or whatever you want to call it, because like, even those words alone suggest a particular type of way of understanding or thinking about it, the idea of it being a problem, for example, or mental health. So there's so much even in the language that we use alone um, that we really need to stop and think about. And I think what we've noticed, and I'm not alone in, in noticing this, is that over the last particularly even the last 30 years, the way we talk about and think about mental health has actually become narrower and narrower and narrower. And unfortunately, when it comes to stuff like mental health, there is no one size fits all. So while conceptualizations of, you know, maybe a biochemical imbalance or, you know, the more cognitive kind of interpretations of our, our interpretations or understandings, understandings of the world, while they might work well for some people, they may not work for everybody. So what I think philosophy can help us do and remind us is that there are lots of different ways of thinking about the world. And Anya and I in particular have been looking at a philosopher that really Anya has introduced me to called Cora Diamond. And she's brilliant on this because she talks about the difficulty of reality and what happens when we come up against an experience. And you can use whatever words you want to describe it. So in, in my own research, I found that a lot of people talk about their mental health problems, for example, as it. Um, so they'll just talk mm. about it rather than my diagnosis or my disorder. It's just this it, this thing that's there in my life. And what's really lovely about the work of Cora Diamond is that she gives us a way of thinking about and looking at and examining it, whatever it might be, in a way that 
I hadn't come across before. And it's something that Oni and I have been working on quite a lot, particularly for a paper we're working on at the moment. So I don't know, Oni, if you want to jump in there a bit on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think this whole idea in mental health of having a difficulty of, of labeling and a difficulty of not even ha having the concept, not even knowing how to talk about what the problem is. I think that's, that's, I don't know, I think philosophy can really come in there because philosophy has always been interested in this idea of living a good life, you know, in that, in that Aristotelian sense of flourishing, but it's, it's also interested, and this dimension is probably more relevant for our project, in developing a rich account of what human life is, so whether you're flourishing or not, and, and it has always been interested in the difficulties, as Diamond says, and the blind spots of how we experience the world with others. So, and, and of course, there, there are particular philosophical traditions, not just ancient Greek philosophy, but existentialism, phenomenology, and what's sometimes called ordinary language philosophy, that deal very directly with a set of concepts recognisable in the mental health world, like anxiety, vulnerability, darkness, and deflection. Um, and the reason that I turn, or that Emma and I both turn lately to the work of people like Cora Diamond and Daniel Cavell is that they, they're, they're comfortable, I suppose, in, in, in sitting with these ideas of human vulnerability. They're, they're very comfortable with this idea that the human is limited, that there's a limit not just to what we can know, but what we can know about each other. Um, and I, I think their ability to sit with these limitations is, is I suppose it reminds us that these limitations are philosophical phenomena, I suppose, rather than individual problems. So one message that comes through, I think, in, in mental health in general, but maybe in kind of compassion focused therapies in particular, is this idea that, that suffering is normal. It's part of life. It's not a sign that I'm in some way flawed or I need, I need to be fixed in some way. Um, and, and, and this is natural, like evolutionary psychology will tell us that our brains are very threat focused. So, so being worried and being afraid is part of the way we've evolved because we've had to evolve that way because it keeps us safe. Um, so philosophy, I think, helps us to hold on to this idea of suffering and again, not to see it as a, as a problem or something to be fixed. Um, so suffering is normal and also happiness is a passing state. And I love, I'm going to invoke the contemporary philosopher Marion Hume here. So she has this fantastic acronym of HAT, H-A-T-T. So she says that she's given up trying to be HAT, trying to be happy all the time because it's just not possible. It's, it's, it's just not achievable. And I, I, I think none of us, to be honest, would want to be around somebody who's happy all the time because you know they're just insufferable people. So again, it's the idea that our limitations and our, our sufferings and our lack of being happy all the time define us as human because actually, we're complicated and, and that, com that complexity is our humanity. Um, it's not something that we want to lose again. It's not something that we want to fix. And so again, Diamond and, and Cavell allow us to, to, to sit with those ideas. Mm. It's, it, it strikes me as you've said something there about complexity and I, I, I love the idea that academics are about complexity, that, you know, that we bring complex solutions to complex problems or just complex things and, like we have to be able to sit and dwell with them. Emma, I, if Anya's point there makes me think about that, um, you know, if, if, if we want to have a discourse, if, if we want to re, uh, reconceptualize um, our own individual uh, thoughts on mental health, then how, how, do we, how do we learn a language to do that? Um, like what, what do people with mental health difficulties say about themselves you can think about your own phd perhaps there and and, and how yeah. do we develop that language yeah and i think that point on uncertainty and finding a way to live with uncertainty is so so important because i think we've kind of gotten into this way of being in the world where we think science and i say this obviously with a scientist in the group but we think that science has a solution for everything and we've come to maybe adopt a little bit more of a mechanistic sort of a, an approach to life and our problems that something breaks down i need to find myself an expert who knows an awful lot about it to whom I can go and, and they'll fix me and then everything will be fine again. And I often think about, there was one young man I worked with and he spoke about how he had quite a significant psychotic episode that really interrupted his, his life. He was, he was a very young, young fella. And 
he said that he left hospital with this sense that his leg had been broken, but now it was fixed again. And all he needed to do was just to make sure he didn't break it again and just, you know, carry on as normal. Um, but he actually ran into difficulties pretty quickly a couple of months after leaving hospital. And he spoke a lot about that, about how for him, he really needed to understand what was going on for him, that it wasn't just as simple as problem, solution, your grand now, move on. It had been a major, he described it as a trauma in his life, and he needed to make sense of it and integrate it into his story. And for my research, it's been really interesting to see that how people make sense of it, whatever it is, really varies. And in some ways, it almost leans a little bit on their own particular worldview. So we found that students who, and I know this is a very broad sense, but that who might be particularly scientific or mechanistic in their orientation towards the world and how they live and understand everything, that they found that the understandings that maybe were offered by the medical model or more kind of cognitive understandings of mental health really worked for them and that it helped them make sense of what was going on for them. And that was great because it, it helped them override the uncertainty and move on. Whereas for some other people that I've met and researched and done some work with, that they have found that these understandings haven't really worked for them, that in some ways they've held them back or, or made their lives that little bit harder. So for them, it was a longer road to find a way of making sense of their experiences that worked for them. And I think that's what the beauty of this type of work that Oni and I are doing together is, is that it creates a range of options for us to understand and make sense of our experiences so that we are not kind of sho shoehorned into this there's only one size and this is it and it's going to fit it, it's a way of thinking about our experiences whether it's depression or anxiety or whatever words you might want to use on it but in a way that isn't limited to maybe one or two conceptualizations so it's about trying to think about our experiences in a new way, but also maybe to some degree, as Anya has said, finding a way of coming to terms with uncertainty, which is which is really difficult at the very best of times as we're really coming to face 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 with right now, because we find that once somebody can make sense of it, and I know it sounds almost a little bit trite and very simplistic, because if you can make sense of what's going on in your life, it's much easier to live with. But the important thing is to find a way of making sense of it that makes sense to you. So it's not something that's necessarily just given to you or an all round understanding because the joy of being a human is that we're all so unique, we are all so complex that one size couldn't possibly ever serve to fit all. Um, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's always in, uh, interesting and humbling as a physicist working with colleagues like Emma and Anya to talk about the role of science and very much to think about the limits that science has. It's certainly not something I as a physicist would have come across in my education, where I think colleagues working in the humanities tend to have a far better sense of what the sciences do more so than our view of the humanities. And I think education is a special place for us being able to come together. I know Anya and I have shared many very fruitful conversations on that on that very topic. I want to ask you uh, both um, something that's coming up an awful lot in the in the in the questions, um, and I encourage uh, viewers to submit more if if they wish in the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, it it might be something that links to that idea of creating a language for us to discuss mental health, um, and it's it's about philosophy and philosophy in schools in particular. Do you, do you have a view, we might start with Anya, about the role of, of, of philosophy in school, uh, Anya, and how it might equip people to have sort of a discourse or a language or just a way of discussing uh, the issues we're talking about here today? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the great thing about raising philosophical questions with, with children is that there is no textbook and there's no set of answers, so they, they can't worry that they're wrong. You know, so in that sense, it gives a certain amount of ventilation, it gives a certain amount of space. Um, and I think as well, philosophy for children, as you know, the pedagogy that was developed by Matthew Lippmann is a very kind of democratic pedagogy. It's all about putting the child first and letting the child ask their philosophical question, because unfortunately, um, sometimes our education systems can kind of kill the natural curiosity that, that children might have, you know. So we talk a lot about the importance of of, of curiosity and we do this at third level as well you know we talk about the importance of developing critical thinking but in the ways that we teach ourselves and in the ways that we assess we don't always allow space for that kind of curiosity to generally be to, to genuinely be expressed and um, so i do think that philosophy can be very important for young people um, and it can sometimes 
because it's that bit more open, it can sometimes be a vehicle for, and, and this links back to mental health again, maybe other issues or other existential conundrums maybe that they're grappling with in their own way. It, it's, a, it's a place for those questions to come out and, and a place for those anxieties to come out in kind of a, a safe and, and structured way where they, um, they're encouraged to have a voice. And again, I think that philosophy is really important for um, developing that voice, getting away from the discourses, getting away from the small talk, or this is how we have to talk about, you know, this is the, the way that we talk about certain phenomena. It encourages, um, hopefully, not just a, a kind of argumentative stance, in the sense that my reasons are better than your reasons, but more that it, it opens up our imaginations to think about things differently. Um, and I know that, that that can be very valuable from the teachers I know who are doing philosophy with children in schools. Um, all the way through from, you know, from, from very young children, seven and eight year olds, all the way through to 18 year olds and leaving um, it, it's, 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 it's a place where they can let off steam, I suppose. And mm. um, I, I, I actually, I, I, I came across a, a fantastic statement during the week. He was, he was talking about the goals of liberal education, actually, but I think it can apply to philosophy. And, um, you know, when we talk about education, sometimes we think about education as this kind of, um, you know, this kind of uh, system that children go through so that they can come out the other side and get a job. You know, the question is always asked when you go to college, you know, what are you studying? But what will you be? This was the question that I got from my, my, my father a lot. You know, he couldn't really get his head around studying philosophy. He, he wasn't happy with that. He just wanted to know what will you be at the end of all this? Um, but the line I really like that I've come across lately is that liberal education and philosophy center will see that. It, it doesn't prepare us for society, so it doesn't necessarily prepare us for the world of work, but it prepares us for those moments when we fall out of society. And I think that's exactly in tune with what's happening right now, because all our general structures have been taken away. None of us have careers or jobs anymore, and we're forced to look back upon ourselves and find other ways of defining ourselves that aren't just, you know, what do we do or what's our job? Yeah. <laughs> If I could come in on that as well, and I, I know Shane, you said at the start, I was a co-founder at Jigsaw. I wish I was, I certainly wasn't, but I was very fortunate to, to be around from the very beginning of part of an extraordinary journey led by Dr. Tony Bates. And Tony always described mental health as the three-legged stool of identity, purpose, and belonging. And that's always stayed with me. And again, it kind of comes back to, there's lots of definitely lots of different tips and tricks and things we can do to look after our mental health. But when it comes to things like identity, purpose and belonging, these are things that are much more complex and deeper and need to be explored and maybe in a, a different way. And we see that well-being is now part of school curriculum. But for me, like this year, I was very fortunate to teach a little bit of the module that only teaches um, with the PME students in UCD. But I actually took it as an opportunity to go along and attend the different lectures. And it was one of the best things I, I did. I thoroughly enjoyed going back and being a student again. But the one thing that really struck me listening every week to all these lectures was how this really was the stuff of mental health. The kind of things like Lonnie did an entire lecture on identity and who we are and how we position ourselves and that transition from being a student to a teacher and what that means and how to ne negotiate that and navigate that. For me, that was that was the meat of, of mental health and I think we often divide our disciplines on helpfully into there's a philosopher there's a psychologist there's a teacher there's a you know mental health professional but actually when it comes to the being of humans we all have different contributions to make and I think philosophy it's just a particular label on a way of doing and thinking about things that I think we can all benefit from and most particularly for children and, and young people particularly in that teenage part in your in your life. Emma, there's a question from one of the viewers on that very issue of, of younger people. And um, I, I don't remember if it was a he or her, but they are uh, interested in how do we talk to children or how should we talk to, uh, to children at the moment about the, the current pandemic? And what would a philosopher have to say about that? I think one of the joys of philosophy is it reminds us first and foremost that there is no right or wrong way. I think um, I'm very fortunate at the moment to be speaking a lot with parents and principals and teachers and they all say the same thing. I'm worried I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm worried I'm saying the wrong thing. And when it comes to mental health, and again, this is probably so basic, but it is the basic stuff that really matters. The foundation is the relationship. So the fact that a child or a young person can speak to you about 
what they're experiencing and, and what's going on for them is a huge testament to a relationship. And that in and of itself is going to do so much for mental health. But in terms of talking about it, I think I would always say about children in particular, they have this way of knowing. They'll always know what's going on. And it's important to be honest about what you're feeling or what they might be feeling and encourage a way of talking about experiences that in some way doesn't necessarily label them or define them. I think at the moment we hear a lot about, you know, anxiety or this or that or the other. And actually, of course, we're going to be worried in this time. Of course, we're going to be grieving when we lose a loved one or we lose a job or these are very normal human experiences. And one of the things I enjoy most about philosophy is that you pick up a book that was written by somebody 1500 years ago and you realize that they were struggling with these exact same questions. How do I talk about, how do I communicate and come to terms Terms with experiences that are overwhelming and often far beyond my control. Um, I, I think another one here is, um, and Anya or Emma might like to come in on this, is people are asking about what, what happens if you can't define the it, right, you know, and uh, related to that, others are asking, well, what, do we need to learn a new language in order for us to have uh, this broader discourse? Like, what does, and this is the question from one of the viewers, is like, how do you, how do you parse this in a non-academic way so that something somebody could do? I'm worried a little bit, however, that's kind of veering towards, or perhaps it, it, it can't, uh, veer toward the, you know, here's five things that you should do to improve your own mental health. Who, who'd like to come in on that? I'm happy to jump in. I see. I can see Anya's face from here. <laughs> um, but I, I think again, like for me, one of the things was how can we come to terms as a society with uncertainty? We have ways of structuring and understanding and processing pretty much everything except for the bigger, deeper issues in life. I remember some of the students that I worked with expressing the frustration of a, themselves not being able to make sense of their experiences, but even more than that, other people around them, like their family, their friends, their loved ones going, well, what's wrong with you? What is it? And what's going on? And who do you go to? And, and is there a, a treatment for that? Or what do you do? And you know, the usual responses that we might involuntarily come up with when we care about somebody and see them struggling, we, we want things to, to be different and to go away. And I think there's something, and perhaps this is what COVID-19 is teaching us all a very harsh lesson in, in being able to sit with uncertainty and the unfamiliar and mm -hmm. not just not necessarily accept it, but maybe come back to finding a way of being with it and perhaps reflecting on it. And again, this is where it's so tempting to jump into the, this is the 10 things you do to talk to your child, or these are the 500 tips to stay sane in a, a pandemic. And you can Google those, they're, they're all there. I think there is something though about learning how do we come to terms with the radical uncertainty that comes with being human, not just a human in a, a pandemic. Yeah, and I, I, you know, perhaps it touches on just, just our need to resolve things continuously, our need to tie things down and say, well, that's what that is, you know, and to define it and put it in a box and say, I've dealt with it now. Anya, uh, Mary Delaney has, has, has written a great question here, and uh, she says that uh, you, you mentioned about suffering being something that we all experience and, you know, and, and staying with it. And Mary uh, says she's from a generation that accepted that, that mm -hmm. things can be tough. Um, uh, however, she, she believes today that people believe that they deserve total success in life. And if they don't mm -hmm. have it all, they're somehow failed. Um, mm -hmm. like it, what would you have to say about that? She has asked if it, it may be creating additional mental health problems. But what would you have to say just about the general idea of a generational issue? And perhaps today we feel we must have it all to be happy. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I suppose across all generations, you know, we're all doing our best right now. And I think every generation is, is, is suffering equally. Young children are suffering terribly from this pandemic. They would love to be able to get back to school even for one day a week. And um, the middle generation is completely squeezed because they don't have their extended families anymore. So they're trying to they're trying to mind children. They're trying to keep their careers going. And the older generation potentially are very lonely because they're not getting to see grandchildren. So I don't know if 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 if. Um, there's a generational difference right now. I think we're all we're all suffering certainly with COVID. We're all doing our best with it, um, but we're all you know confronted with these massive existential questions like you know what are we doing here and what's the point of it all and what's the meaning of life and what's the meaning of death and you know that's on a good day you know when you get as far as super values. So 
um, th these are these are questions I think that impact on everyone. I, I don't know if, if young people or the younger generation are, are, are less resilient. And, and there's another term that's really part of the mental health discourse right now. There's certainly a perception that they are. Um, but from, you know, from my students that I work with, I, I, I certainly don't perceive a lack of resilience. Um, I, I, one thing that I've, I've been thinking about lately, and I, I was speaking to my mother about this actually, is, is, is the difference in how we are um, we are experiencing time at the moment. And I think this is a really interesting one for all generations because um, usually we make sense of time by thinking about the past and by projecting into the future. We like to plan. And at the moment, we can't do that. We cannot plan anything because to take our own workplace, we don't know when we're going back to UCD. We have some vague rumours that we'll be back in September, but we're not sure. We also not, aren't sure how long this current situation will go on for and actually whether we'll ever go back to what used to be called normality. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we have lessons to learn from, from different generations and we all need to come together at this time because this is all completely unprecedented. And I don't think anyone is dealing, any generation is, is, is getting full marks for dealing with it right now. We're all just modeling. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's quite normal. No generation is a monopoly on being right about things. I suppose context is always changing. Emma, a question uh, for you from Roe Aiken, who, who wonders what role does philosophy play in increasing a positive personal identity? Well, that's a great question. Thanks, Ro. Actually, I think Anya might be a better place to answer this one. As, as somebody who got to sit through her identity lecture, I know that she has a lot of good things to say. <laughs> Um, well, uh, hi Ro, <laughs> thanks for your question. Um, looking forward to seeing you back in UCD soon. We really, I really miss you. I really miss all my colleagues. Um, about identity, I mean, I suppose I would say that um, identity is something, and again, it goes back to Emma's idea of purpose and belonging. It, it's something that you, you, you create for yourself in your own actions and in your life. It's not something that, that can be given to you. You know, so I use the example with the with the secondary school teachers of, um, you know, an, an English teacher who always has a t has a spelling test on a Friday. So you decide as an English teacher, I'm going to do it that way as well. And I always have a spelling test on Friday, and you're asked why, and you don't know why. It, you're trying to be that good teacher. Um, and, and we do that when we're developing identities. We, we try on versions of ourselves, ourselves and we try and kind of emulate role models that we've had. And that can only ever get us so far. At some point, we have to stop and put our flag on the ground and kind of claim our own identity and, and fully get behind ourselves. It's a process, I think, and no more than learning to be a teacher. It's, it's, it's a process that doesn't really end. It, it's our, our identities were, are constantly you know, canvases that we're working on, we're, we're constantly changing and emulating and failing and wishing that we were better and seeking out role models. Um, so I hope that's a straightforward answer. <laughs> um, it's lovely. Uh, Emma, I have a question for you. Um, and it, it came from one of the viewers earlier on who asked, who, who remarked rather that the, the government at the moment is, is saying it's being led by the science, which, which is great and it's important. And they asked, um, what, how might they be also led by philosophy at the moment? Yeah, it's interesting, all right, because one of the things, and I know, Shane, you had a lovely article in the Irish Times today about this, about how we need to think about the thinking. Um, and there's a lot of science, a lot of facts, and, and some of it can be conflicting. And so we're, we're automatically there placed into a kind of situation where we need to try and decide for ourselves who to believe, what's true, what's false, to a degree. I think in this sort of a situation, it's actually very helpful to have um, Neffet and any sort of expertise who can tell us exactly what we need to do in relation to, to the coronavirus. But then there's all sorts of consequences of the pandemic that we are left a little bit isolated and alone with. And the kind of things that we've spoken about already, you know, how do I manage my time? How do I get through each day? How do I come to terms with the loss of my job or the loss of a loved one? And these are the bigger things that are there permanently. So science has been really helpful in saying, you know, wash your hands or this phase is going to involve this and this is what we need to do and we need to follow that. But it doesn't necessarily help us when we're sitting at home in our houses and we're trying to contend with whether it's children or caring for elderly family members or 
trying to find a way of managing our workload when we're kind of in this sense of, and I don't know if I'm alone in this, but I don't know how it happens, but every day I get up and then suddenly it's dinner time and I'm not quite sure what happened in between or what I have to show for it. And I know that's a very minor thing, but it makes you reflect about what you do with your life and your time and how much energy you put into things and why you put your energy into those things. And are those the right things to put your energy into? So that all of these things are there simmering away under underneath the science and underneath the important things about you know the distancing rules and the regulations and how things are evolving in terms of the pandemic and its spread or, or not worldwide so i think that philosophy does have a very important role but it's a much more subtle one and unfortunately again well i don't know i, I feel like i'm a fraud in some ways speaking about philosophy but it's that sense of how do we manage in the, the kind of everyday sense, as well as the, the practical scientific parts. And unfortunately, there is no right or wrong on this. And this is something that I, I think if I was to say anything about being in, in anything about mental health is that there is no one size fits all, there is no right or wrong. There, there can't really be the you know, guidance from Neffet on managing the existential crisis you're currently going through, because in some ways it's only unique to you. But again, there's something reassuring in knowing that these are kind of crises that we as a, as a human species have come to terms with over and over and over again for thousands of years. So at least I'm not completely alone in my anxiety or my existential mm -hmm. crisis and mess. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, just to add to what Emma's saying there, I mean, I think there's, there's something very important about situating if you can and, and you know i would i would i would say this can't always be the case of course but if you can to kind of situate the individual suffering in a broader story of what it means to be human because that will give you that connection that is is you know as emma says one of the cornerstones of of of, of your well-being um yeah, I, I, there's a very interesting range of points about as people are saying not everyone is is feeling um particularly anxious or, or, or having what we would, might term as dark or negative uh, emotions at the moment. Negative is probably not a good word to use there. I apologize. But you know what I mean? The, 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 the darker end of the spectrum, shall we say. Um, and people are wondering about that. You know, they're saying, you know, am I the only one that's it's kind of kind of quite enjoying this? Perhaps they're not sick and they're, they're just making the most of it. Um, any comments on that? Some people saying yeah. they're even being ambivalent at the moment about what's going on. It's just kind of it's going on outside their front door. Well, one of the really interesting things for me at the moment, and as I said, I'm doing some research. I'm very fortunate to be part of a really exciting study on, on children's experiences of schooling. And so we, we, I'm in talking to parents and principals and teachers. And the thing that I keep coming up against, and besides the I'm worried I'm doing the wrong thing and am I doing enough and am I doing it right? It's also that sense of, am I wrong to be kind of enjoying this? I, I've never, you know, I hear from parents that they've never spent so much time with their children, that they get to enjoy breakfast now, that they're not throwing on school uniforms and throwing lunches and, you know, school bags and loading everyone into car and rushing off. And there is the sense of being able to stop and enjoy nature and cooking and time together. And for a lot of young people, and it's really interesting, I, I get to connect in with colleagues in the youth mental health sector quite a lot at the moment. Um, and what I'm finding and hearing really strongly is that for a lot of young people, anxiety levels are plummeting, that they're really dropping. And it's, it's interesting because we've talked about this a lot amongst my more mental health colleagues. And I'm always brought back to that Krishnamurti quote, which I'm going to butcher because I can never remember quotes directly. But it's something like, um, it's no measure of health to adapt to a, a sick society. And there's something for a lot of young people who are finding that being in this absolutely abnormal world of being at home and being with your family and and I know this isn't all homes and all families but for a lot of young people that they're actually doing quite well they feel safe they feel secure they feel connected they feel all the kind of things that are good for mental health and I hear from schools and teachers and principals that they're concerned about what's going to happen when schools reopen how are they going to get kids back and into this world and so for me and, and certainly my colleagues in mental health we're saying isn't this an interesting opportunity to reflect on what are the aspects of our environments and um, particularly for young people and children what are the aspects of those environments that are really hard for them to adapt to and adjust to that have been removed by virtue of them being you know in their family units or being at home or being perhaps a little bit more closeted and it's it's a big debate and again it's one of those ones we may not have the answer to but it's important to say it's there it's it's a thing and you know there's a lot of learning in that 
Mm. I, I think yeah. just to just to briefly comment on like I, I think there there are definitely very positive aspects of the COVID situation. It, it's this radical social experiment that we've all been thrown into, and I think the key will be to, to uh, you know, when reflecting on this, is is to take some of the good bits forward because there are some good bits. There are some people who are delighted not to have their stressful commutes um, and to have more time with their family, as Emma says, and particularly you know maybe the kids who are overburdened with all these various activities they have to do. So. You know, it's going to pre precipitate a, a time of reflection for everyone on, on what we can take forward from this. And that's definitely a good thing. Absolutely. Um, may, may I, I, we're, we're coming, unfortunately, to the end. We have 57 questions, which is remarkable from, from the mm -hmm. people who are viewing, many hundreds of people looking in at the moment. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to kind of bring things to a, a kind of a general a kind of pointing towards a close. Uh, by asking you, uh, bring it back to UCD and asking you about the context in which you work. We work in higher education and there's been a, an enormous number of comments uh, from people about the, the perceived crisis uh, of mental health for, for young people by some of the comments uh, that I'm, I'm getting here on the screen. I, I wonder how, how, how your work how, uh, may impact or may focus or touch upon higher education and the discourse around mental health uh, therein. Anya, would you like to take that first? Yeah, thanks Shane. Um, absolutely, like I, I do think in terms of mental health, the university years can be very formative, but they can also be very challenging. And, and, and one of the starting points from my project with Emma is this idea that there is a crisis in mental health in universities at the moment. And this is a crisis that goes across all levels. So it's a crisis for undergraduate students who are, um, they're under huge pressure to kind of compete with each other in this very tightened job market. It's a, it's a crisis for early career staff, for precarious faculty who um, constantly live under the threat of casualization and the fact that their, 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 their jobs might be gone next year. And I think this is a huge worry in the third level context right now. Um, so in, in my broader work, I am interested in, in mental health, but I'm interested in, in kind of the ideals of the university, you know, and, and Michael Oakshot in particular has this wonderful idea that the university can give us the gift of the interval. So it can give us this wonderful time out. It's a, a, a space where um, we can kind of test out different ideas without fear of repercussions from those around us, kind of a, a protected space to experiment with different identities. Um, and, you know, the, the, this ideal of the university goes back to Newman, the founder of UCD, who knows us you know, projected an image of the university as a kind of utopia where all these respectful thinkers come together to advance knowledge. And we do need these ideals of the university. I think we need them now more than ever. But there's also a growing sense, and this is something I've been working on, that, that the university is a place for darker or more shadowy aspects. So yes, it's a place where great minds come together to think, but it's also a place where competition, for individualism, for loneliness, for cultures of speed, and this is something, Shane, that you and I have written about. So I'm open to this idea that higher education can actually harm us. And I've been using this article in my teaching lately called mm -hmm. Confronting the Dark Side of Higher Education. And there's a great line in there from the authors that says, higher education is a place to be a bastard. So it can potentially be a place to be unfair, to be egoistic and to be cruel. And I've been thinking a lot about that and how I don't know, like, we almost need to confront this darkness of the university. We can't deny it. We can't pretend we live in Newman's ideal. We need to confront these darknesses as a necessary first step if we are to move forward and imagine the university of the future. Anya, can I follow up there, just given the, the, the I suppose, the, the, the national television sensation that we're all enjoying at the moment, what, what are your thoughts then on normal people and, the, and the, the role that those characters have in their experience in university? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very, it's very telling. And we've certainly talked about this, Shane, that, you know, when you're in university as an undergraduate, you do have this sense that everybody else is having a fantastic time. And if you're not having a fantastic time, there's something wrong with you. And I think what normal, normal people kind of captures that ambivalence really well, it captures the kind of short circuit that we all experience when the identity that we have from our hometowns just doesn't really marry with the identity that we now have going to university in, in normal people in there's a particular uh, a social class dimension there you know you have the the, the 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 guy from sligo suddenly finding himself in the urbane environment of trinity undergraduate arts um so i i again i i, I think there's always been there have always been difficulties in the university but for undergraduates it is it can be a very very difficult time and it's a time 
it would be more helpful to admit that we find it difficult and that we all find it difficult rather than to pretend that it's great. Emma, um, there's a question from, from many people about that people want to read more, uh, which, which is, I think is a, is a wonderful way for us to perhaps to finish our conversation this evening. Uh, Lucy Corcoran in particular is looking for, for reading advice. I know Lucy's uh, well known to yourself. Um, what might you advise people uh, reading? And Anya may want to, to chime in on this as well. So Emma, what would you, where, where, would you, where would you begin? Well, if it's all right, Shane, I might comment on that last question. And I see Anya's Lava Seuss there for the reading for my great friend Lucy Corcoran, um, which I think she'd be a, a great person to, to pass over to for that bit. But it's interesting that you, you pick up on, on normal people. And I think there's a couple of things that we skipped over in that question. One of them was about a crisis in mental health in higher education. And actually, this is something I hear about time and time and time again. And uh, in one of my last roles in Jigsaw, I had the fortune of doing a lot of education and training work and, and meeting with members of the public and asking them a lot about mental health and what their assumptions were. And we'd invariably hear, mainly from adults, that young people are they're all in a crisis. There's a, a you know, pandemic of mental illness, that sort of thing. And I suppose I'd say, hold up a little bit and let's check that. That. and this idea of normal and abnormal let's come back to that a little bit more um, like even just three weeks ago there was a study published in JAMA which is the Journal of America the American Medical Association and it, it was a really interesting study where they took about I think it was over a thousand people born in Dunedin and New Zealand between 1972 and 1973 and they followed this group of people and they're still following them um, and what that was the most interesting thing was that they found that 86% of this random group of people, just like you or I, it could have been done in Dublin, in which we'd, we'd probably all be in it, um, but they found that 86% of this group of people had one mental disorder, and 85% could have been diagnosed with two mental disorders. And what was the most interesting thing about the paper, and it was very interesting, it had all sorts of very, like, very complex diagrams and went on for 14 pages, was that at no point did the authors stop to question whether the problem was with the people or with the conceptualization of mental disorder and mental illness. Because at a certain point, if we're all mentally ill, we have to question, is this a helpful way of thinking about what it is to be normal or abnormal and who's them and who's us? And this is something that Oni and I spend quite a lot of time talking about, about who's the them, who's the us? How do we get to this situation where you have those people over there with the mental disorders and all of us who are the experts and the, the people in the universities who get to talk about them? And that's something that we actually haven't hit on tonight, which is interesting, but maybe it comes in nicely in relation to that last point. But I will pass over to Anya for the, the reading for Lucy. Okay, Anya, our, our homework then, uh, our where, homework. What, are we go, what are we going to read? I assume oh, we're God. starting with your latest book, Anya, are we? Stop. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, well, you know, when you asked me earlier, what am I reading right now? Embarrassingly, I don't get to read anything. I have a toddler, so I, I read Peppa Pig and I read about animals on the farm. So, you know, I'm kind of the worst person to ask. But I do think a top tip, if you are interested in these ideas of where education meets philosophy meets mental health, um, UCD's Centre for Ethics in Public Life has a fantastic web page up and running right now where um, the moral philosophers in the department have written these fantastically reflective pieces on dealing with COVID. They're very, very rich and insightful pieces. And I think they're one of the fantastic things about them is that they will kind of send you on a paper trail to other philosophers. So it's the Centre for Ethics in Public Life. There's a great piece. I think it was up today. I, I only came across it today. It might have been up a few days now by my colleague, Lisa Foran. Um, who's an absolute superhero and, and one of the, the smartest people I know. Uh, Lisa writes about very complicated French and German thinkers while minding two tiny babies. So she's, 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 she's amazing. But Lisa has a fantastic um, piece on grief and the pandemic. Pan pandemic. Um, there's also a wonderful piece from Silvia Panizza, who's an Italian philosopher based in UCD philosophy, but she's actually back in Italy at the moment, um, weathering the lockdown. And she writes really well about Christine Korsgaard, the Mars philosopher, specifically about um, what we as, as, as humans share with non-human animals. So she has this idea that, you know, uh, what we're missing at the moment is exactly what defines us. Um, it, it, things like, you know, um, being able to get fresh air, being able to um, interact with each other and being able to experience the natural world having physical closeness. These are all the types of things that the pandemic is block blocking us for, from, um, but these are ultimately what we share with all types of animals. So it's just an interesting take on, on, on Kantian moral mm -hmm. philosophy. 
Mm. Uh, directly to that website. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, so one of the questions here is, uh, will the reading tips be posted separately? separately? I, I can ask our colleagues in the alumni office if they'd be willing to, in the uh, the YouTube that goes with this video when it's when it's published later in the week, if uh, Anya and Emma's reading uh, list might, might go with it, just to give it that proper UCD lecture style, you're, you're definitely going to get homework. There will be an online assessment in, in a number of weeks and we'll deliberate over your, your grades and um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in touch. Um, I, I'd like to thank um, uh, Anya Mahan and Emma Farrell for their, for their wonderful contribution this evening. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. I hope that you guys uh, did too. Um, and I, I'm delighted to say we, we had well over 330 uh, people uh, attending at times with uh, 68 questions and comments from people. I'm sorry I didn't get to more of them. But it, it is great that uh, to the wonders of technology, we are able to stay somewhat connected at the moment to keep ideas flowing and to have conversations which, uh, which touch upon our humanity in, in its broadest sense. And I, I personally think that's what the role of the university is all about. And it's, it's, it's not about just doing those things on campus or uh, behind our closed doors. It is, it is about having a broad discourse with and uh, by uh, the public. And so thank you so, so much for coming this evening. I encourage you to, to attend some of the future events and so to inform you perhaps about them and what you might expect. I'll now hand back over to my colleague, Grace. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Shane. And thank you, Emma and Anya. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating conversation. I think there was a takeaway there for everybody in the audience um, and an awful lot of stuff that um, anyone could identify with. Um, so thank you again so much. We're absolutely thrilled to have you as part of the series. Um, thank you also to everybody who tuned in this evening and especially everybody who posted a question or a comment. And apologies if we couldn't get to it, but as Shane mentioned, we had loads of questions and comments this evening. So it's fantastic to see that engagement. Um, don't forget that the conversation will be on YouTube. So it'll be the Alumni Relations use, uh, YouTube channel and we will post that reading as well uh, with, along with that. So you can re-watch it or share it with somebody who didn't get to view tonight. Um, you can also send us suggestions at our alumni email address. So that's alumni at ucd.ie. So next Thursday, uh, we have a special edition of the In Conversation series as part of the UCD Festival at Home. We'll be welcoming author, UCD alumnus and creative fellow, Colm Tobin, who will be in conversation with Professor Margaret Kelleher from UCD School of English, Drama and Film. And they'll be discussing the global pandemic's impact on the cultural and creative space. So that's one not to be missed next week. You'll be able to sign up at festival.ucd.ie and the link for that will go live tomorrow. So you can sign up from tomorrow for that. So lastly, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, thanks again to our speakers, to Emma Farrell, Anya Mahan and Shane Bergen. And we're looking forward to welcoming you all back next week for the discussion then. Thanks a million. <laughs>